Well, good morning. That is from uh, Underdog. Is, that, is it just called Underdog or American Underdog? American. American Underdog. I have never in my life played a promotional clip in church until today. But here's why. Here's why. When I was thinking about this idea of pruning, and if you haven't seen that movie, it's a great movie, faith-based, worth watching. David is the one who told me that I need to watch that. But here's the thing. He went from playing football, trying to get in the NFL, and then was actually in the NFL for a couple of days uh, to stocking shelves in between, looking at boxes of Wheaties with Dan Marino on it, who only went to one Super Bowl, by the way. But anyway, um, and lost badly. But, uh, uh, but here's the thing. So in your life, are there any dead limbs in your life that you are refusing to get rid of? Is there any area of your life, anything that's holding you back from what we're going to talk about, really, our, our real focus today is abiding in Christ. Because the truth is, you can't do your own pruning. God has to do that, but you can hang on. You know, God gets a hold of those limbs, and you, you know there are dead things in your life. There's ways of thinking. There's unforgiveness. There's anger. There's bitterness. Sometimes things that we've learned from other people, bad habits that we've hold on to. And we have to decide, am I going to let God prune my life or not? You know, uh, I have roses, and so I didn't bring my little rose shears today, but I have roses, and, and one of the things, when the, when the fruit of the rose, you know, starts to, to die a little bit, one of the best things you can do is cut it off. And I actually will go to my rose bushes and look at the leaves, and if they start to have any kind of spot on them or start to die, just pull them off right away, get them away from the tree and the Rose actually grows better because I've cut it. You know, some of the trees in my yard are a little bigger than rose bushes. And I was going to bring, uh, I actually have an electric pole saw, but it leaks oil. That was really what I wanted to bring today. But David told me that our insurance won't cover people in the audience that I got close to. But this is my backup to that. And there's times where when you've got oak trees or you've got trees that are just kind of growing wherever, you'll either get a dead limb or you'll get a limb that grows out of nowhere for no reason. You, oak trees will all of a sudden in the middle of the tree just have a limb like, we're just going to put one here. And if you don't cut that off, it'll become a burden, not just to you walking past it, but to the tree. God knows the things in your life that you may love. But they actually are hindering you. you. You may enjoy them. They may be something that you think, but, but I don't want to quit doing that. Or you might be like Popeye saying, I am what I am. I've always been an angry person. I've always been a fill in the blank. And it could be my prayer for you is as you look at this, you'll realize that there's not just a list that God gives us, which is the good news. You don't become a Christian and then God goes, now here's the list, fix it. But through the Holy Spirit, he slowly says, you need to prune this area. You need to prune that area. So let me read this, and then I'll give you kind of where we're going to go today. John 15, 1 through 5. These are Jesus' words, and here's what he says. I am the true vine. Kudzu, by the way. Ready? One foot a day. One foot a day. It, well, I, 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 thought, I thought it grew a little, and I looked it up, and I thought, that's because it's so unbelievable. You wouldn't think that a foot in a day and they brought it in to stabilize the soil, just like we brought in Brazilian pepper to Florida. We brought in Malaluca to dry out the Everglades. And some University of Miami guy went in a plane and spread seeds of Malaluca all over the Everglades. And we are fighting that now. Some of you have things in your life that are like kudzu. You thought they would be good. Sorry, let's go. Here we go. And I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. A little later, he talks about how he'll burn up branches that, that don't bear fruit. It continues, while every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. See, one thing you don't know about plants is when they send out a, a, a stem and they send it out, the, the thing at the end of it, it's sending a signal to the plant, don't go sideways, go straight. And so it goes straight, goes straight, goes straight. And if you will go out and just take the tip off of that plant, just, just cut the very tip off of that plant, it will then go, because it'll quit sending that signal, it'll then go other 
directions, that little biology major thing every once in a while comes in handy. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken in you. Time out. So, so what Jesus is saying is, you are holy. I have given you my holiness, but you're still hanging on to some dead stuff. Here it goes. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, what does it say? Nothing, Nothing, because you'll do it in the flesh. You'll do it for yourself. You'll be self-promoting. You'll be self-centered. Even the nice things you do will be out of your own self instead of out of God. I really want to do what you want me to do. But here's the thing. Do we really want to let him prune our lives? Do we really want to be fruitful for God or is it just too painful? So today we're going to look at three dead branches, wrong thinking, acting in our flesh, and focusing on ourself. And how do we overcome that? Do we focus on the pruning? No, we focus on remaining in him. So I'm going to go back to that over and over, this idea of remaining in him, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer. Let God convict you of sin, but the Holy Spirit also convicts you of righteousness. So not only the wrong things that he's lopping off, but the things he wants you to do to help you to grow. So here we go. Number one, he prunes our thinking. Einstein said this about thinking, the world as we've created is process of our thinking. It can't be changed without changing our thinking. You know, when we said we're going to go to the moon, some people went, what are you, crazy? Now we're going back. Like Doc. Where's Michelle when I need her ADD? (laughs) Colossians 3, which is where we're going to go today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to camp there a little bit and talk about these ideas. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. So what's he saying? You're not dead to yourself anymore. You've been raised with Christ where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he says this, set your minds. And this word for minds is the way you think, but it's also your desires. What do you focus on? What do you think about? And then he says, on things above, not on earthly things. We love earthly things. We've done more complaining about gasoline than we did praising of Jesus. So which are you focused on? Which would you say came out of your mouth more? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you spent the week complaining, I'm not saying you can't complain about gas prices, but if you spent the week complaining about gas prices, were you really having your heart set on things of heaven? And then it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden. That's the word crypto. I like that word because it's just a cool word and you got a cryptologist, somebody who's trying to see secret things. He says, your life now is hidden with Christ in God. So what's he saying? When God sees you, he sees Christ, which is crazy to us because We tend to, our thinking tends to be, God loves me when I behave, and he doesn't love me when I don't. And yet, what Paul is saying here in Colossians is, God loves you, you are hidden in Christ. Yes, you blow it. Yes, you mess up. And so what's your job? To abide in him and let him go, hey, Eric, you know how you like to control everything? You you know how you want people to not be in the left lane when you're driving and in a hurry? You know how you want other people to get pulled over when they pass you at a thousand miles an hour? But when you're driving fast, you say, oh, Lord, there's a policeman. Help him to not have seen me. Do you know that? (laughs) You know that thing in you that that says, I think so-and-so should behave. I think this line should be moved faster. I think they should give me the service I want. You know those things that pop up in your life, Eric? I want to prune that. When we abide in him, what happens is the Holy Spirit convicts us as we're driving down the road and we find out that we're impatient. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will even say in your heart and in your mind, he'll he'll remind you of something. It's not like out loud. It's not like Noah build an ark. But you're driving and all of a sudden this thought comes to mind. Are you in a hurry? No. So why are you driving so fast? Because I like it. 
Eric, you realize that if gas prices are high, you can just drive slower. I will not complain about gas prices anymore, right? You, you see how we justify things and we do what we want to do? Why? Because we like our life. We say, God, I want to abide in you, except in this area, because I'm really enjoying this. Or I've always thought this way. Or somebody told me that I wasn't worthy of God's love. Or somebody told me that I didn't matter. Or somebody told me that I'm not important. And when we start to read God's word and he, we start to abide in him, what's he do? He starts to cut that junk off. See, often we think of sins as things that people outwardly do. We're going to talk about some of those in a minute. But the truth is, our thinking needs to be pruned. Not everything you think is real. Did you know that? But your thinking affects you. I'm going to show you how. Okay, if you're at home, you can do this too. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. It's nappy time. Some of you have already done started. I don't know what happened. It was before I ever said that. Some of you already had your eyes closed. But anyway, I want you to think about your favorite meal. I want you to imagine sitting at a table and that meal is set before you. And you get out your fork, maybe your knife if you need it, and you start to cut into that meal, and you put a bite in your mouth, and it is the best you have ever had. Now look up here, I want to teach you something real quick. When I do that, even telling you that, my mouth starts to water. I am such a fat person that immediately, as I think about food, my mouth starts to water. I actually have this iFit workout thing that's free right now. And as I work out, the guy in the middle will talk about cheat day. And I get hungry while working out, which is really a bad thing. Because here's how it works. Your thoughts impact your feelings. So you're thinking about food and you start feeling, boy, I wasn't even hungry until pastor started talking about bacon. But I haven't talked about bacon yet. See, because I just imagine that big steak cooked just right. I like this medium rare, but just barely rare, but just right medium. It's been marinated, and maybe I got it at Carabas where they soaked it in who knows what butter for 12 hours or something. And I cut into that steak, and I put it in my mouth. And just thinking about that, then what? Changes how I'm feeling. My mouth is saying, hey, it's time to go. I can say McDonald's on Sunday and have 12 of you text me and go, why did you say McDonald's? I had to have french fries this week. Because what happened? You had a thought, it turned into a feeling, and then what did it do? It impacted your behaviors. That's why they put commercials on TV that say to all be patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onion, and sesame seed bun. Because we go, well, that's just garbage. Oh, delicious. And they fill it with sugar and salt, and our brains go, that's good, we want that. Me stressed, salt, sugar, good. Right? So what happens? So we begin thinking about something, and then what happens? It impacts how we're feeling about something, and then what do we do? Then we'll act on it. We start to behave that way. So let me ask you this. How many things have you worried about this week that you can do nothing about? How often this week did you think about your own desires, your own needs, your own wants. How many times this week did you think God didn't care about you or you didn't matter? See, here's the thing. If we're not careful, we actually not only will allow these from when before we were Christian, we'll actually regrow dead limbs. Some of us, we became Christians and we got rid of man. We let God prune us and he changed our habits and our thinking. And we knew God loved us and we were so excited. But then over the years we said, well, maybe I need to do more or he doesn't love me as much. Instead of recognizing that when he prunes us and when we recognize how much he loves us, it becomes natural, which we're going to talk about next week. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about our thinking this way. 14, 20, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children in regards to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. Now, why do you have to say that? Because two-year-olds do whatever they want. We had a young child here. The parents apologized to me. Oh, I'm sorry last night. I'm like, hey, they're kids. I expect them to act like kids. And guess who was the most hyper kid? Okay, so um, I had a deacon that would take me out of church sometime, and I would count tiles in the bathroom during church. So much better than church service. <laughs> right? Right? So this is my childhood. Uh, I'll tell you more than you ever wanted to know. But anyway, so, so here's the deal. 
we look at children and they say, me want, and then they go after what they want. As an adult, you hopefully don't say everything you're thinking. Isn't it funny how you could be in a deep conversation with one of your children, you get over here, you, hello, yes, okay, okay, hang on just a second, yeah, I'll call you right back in just a minute. Isn't it funny how we can change our behavior based on who it is? Some of you fought all the way here. If I was standing in the parking lot on the way, you'd be like, you can't even, pastor. Doorbell ever ring when you're in the middle of a fight? You ever read that one? That's a lot of fun. Remain in him. How can we remain in him? How can we change our thinking? We can remain in him by beginning to look at his word and understand what he really thinks about you. When he says you're hidden in Christ, what does that mean? How do you feel about that? Have you ever had somebody who really, really liked you and you got around them and you were like, man, they just... When I'm around them, I, I even feel good about myself. They, they actually think I'm all right. They don't think I'm a, a, aggravating, and they, they kind of like my weird personality. And Wow, that's weird. But you know, when Jesus looks at you, he thinks, you're my favorite. But most of us don't feel that way. It's wrong thinking. Now, I've got a great quote there by Elizabeth Beth Elliot. I'm not going to read. Number two. He prunes our earthly nature. So here's a, another one of these dead branches. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, that's where we get the word porn, porn from. Impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Idolatry is any time that you make something more important than God. Anything. It could be something good. I, I don't want to say this out loud. If you make your grandchildren more important than God, you set up an idol, a really small idol, but, right? It's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but it's when we say, that thing is more important than what God wants me to do. I'm going to hang on to this branch because I like it. I can be angry as long as I want. I can be mad. I, I'm not going to change the way I drive. I'm not going to change the way I act towards people. I'm not forgiving that person. And then we wonder why we're so tired, why life feels so heavy, why we've lost our joy. It's time for some pruning. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you live, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. And then he goes into more anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Now, here's the thing. So how do we do that? Because we grew up with our earthly nature. We grew up uh, uh, in the world. And then we become Christians. And what happens? Those old habits come back. So Chris and I were watching a, a series. Some of you may watch it. And it's not my job to tell you what shows you should and should not watch. You need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit about that. We were watching a show. And we watched the first one. And I said, wow, that is actually really clean. There wasn't a bad word. There wasn't a bad situation. That was actually kind of funny. The premise of it, was, that was great. We watched the second one. Fine. Third one, a little bit of language that time. Fourth one, oh my goodness, lots of language. Fifth one, whoa, language out of control. And then the next day I was driving somewhere, something happened, and now I didn't say it out loud, thank God. But my brain went back to those old words that I heard growing up. Now my mom will say that no one in our house ever used profanity. But I went to work with my father. <laughs> and I learned how to drive from him. And he learned from his father. His father actually cussed somebody out on the way to church one day. That's a famous story of my grandfather. Woohoo! What a great heritage I have. And we can wear that as a badge of honor. I've always been this way. This is what we do. Construction workers, that's just how we are. But when I found those words going through my mind, I said, Kristen, I can't watch that anymore. I said, if you want to watch it, that's fine. But I can't watch it because as I'm going, those words are going through my head. And you know what happens if you let that happen long enough, right? 
Now, I can't tell her that she needs to quit. If she wants to watch it, that's fine. Maybe it doesn't bother her. There's some things that bother me that don't bother her. There's things that will bother you that don't bother somebody else. And that's okay. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit in your life and say, God, is that a dead limb? And if it is, are you willing to let him cut it so you can abide in him? Are you enjoying that limb so much that you refuse to abide in him? By the way, guys, I would encourage you. There's a book called Every Man's Battle. If you struggle with your thought life, that's really a, a great book. I would encourage you to get that one. Dear friends, 1 Peter 2. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sin, sinful desires which wage war. This is where we get the word stratego. Okay, strategy, which strategy. So sin, listen, the enemy's been here a lot longer than you and me, so he strategizes how to ruin our lives. And it always starts with thinking. It'll, it'll start you with thinking, well, I don't need that, and that's something good. And I need that, and it's something bad. And that's what the enemy does. He knows, he knows how to push your buttons. Sometimes he's used somebody in your life to say something, and you'll repeat that over and over to you believe a lie. And so he's been strategizing, and then it continues, against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans. I love that word, by the way. That's fun. Okay? Live such good lives among the pagans. That's anybody who's not a Christian, a believer, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify you? No. Glorify God on the day he visits us. So what's your dead branch that you're hanging on to? Is it worry? Is it frustration? What, what is it that you say, I've got to have that? Is there any area of your life, maybe it's a habit or a hurt or a hang-up, that are you going to let him prune it? If you want to abide in him, you have to say, God, would you prune my life? So this week, I would encourage you, listen, sit down with God's word. If you don't have a way to read it, get a daily bread. We've got daily breads out there. You can do an app on your phone. Read a, a verse a day and just begin to make it part of your life, part of your routine, and spend some time in prayer. And if you get still enough, through God's word, the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. We'll encourage you to do what's right, but we'll also prune what's wrong. And sometimes that means, you know, I can't watch that show. Whichever dog you feed, whether it's your fleshly nature or your spirit, that one's going to become stronger. So choose which one you feed. Number three, he prunes our self-focus. Now, most of you know I went to Westminster Christian School in Miami, but I will tell you there were a lot of non-Christians at Westminster Christian School. And there were a lot of people who went through the motions and did religious things, but obviously we didn't really follow Christ. And I was one of those. And at the end of my 11th grade year, the summer of my 11th grade year, I surrendered my life to Christ. I didn't know if it was a rededication. Later, I realized that's the point where I had salvation, where I actually said, God, whatever you want, prune whatever you want, I'm yours. I'll never forget during my senior year, sitting outside. And as I had gone through that year, as I came back to school, I remember thinking, this is totally different. And here's what was wild. I did not care what anyone thought about me. I cared what people thought. Don't, don't hear me the wrong way. I didn't care what they thought about me. And I began to see people and think, how can I help them today? And I was more concerned and became more concerned about helping somebody and going out of my way to be a blessing to them than I was worried about impressing them. And that was a huge change in my life. Many times I just stayed silent because I didn't want to risk stepping out. And I know that's hard to believe I would remain silent. But I didn't want to risk being rejected, so I just stayed quiet. And I had to cut that limb off of rejection and say, hey, how can I help you? What can you do? How do, how do I encourage you? And look for ways to encourage people to the point that halfway through my senior year, a girl that I had known since sixth grade, sitting at the table outside, because we got to have study hall outside as seniors. That was our cool gift, right? She looked at me and she said, something's different about you. What's changed? At a Christian school, I got to share how Christ changed my life, which is crazy at a Christian school. But here's what happens. A lot of people at Christian schools have been inoculated and have just enough of Jesus that they don't pay attention anymore. And so I got to say, hey, 
This is what God's done in me. And this is how my focus has changed. I'll never forget that conversation because it was so weird. Like, how did... And I didn't care that she noticed in me. I cared that she noticed and glorified God, like the verse said before. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Colossians 3, 12 and 4 through 14, holy and dearly loved. Think about that. Did you know you're dearly loved? It's not just that God loves you. He dearly loves you. Remember, you're his favorite. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. By the way, that word bear doesn't mean put up with. A lot of Christians are like, well, I put up with them. No, it means to lift somebody up. It means you look for their needs. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. By the way, you know you have to forgive people? As you get to know people, you have to forgive them. Because as you get to know people, you start to think, well, I thought they had their act together. And then you get to know them and you go, oh, no. And so you can go church to church to church and just get a shallow relationship with people and think they all have their act together. Or you can get to know people and at some point go, oh, no, and then forgive them. Forgive one another. Why? As the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on a garment of love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then a few verses later, it says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Who are you lifting up? Who are you going out of the way to bear with? Who are you close enough to? You know, one of the reasons we have small groups and Bible studies and, and teams that share is so that people get to know each other and can encourage each other. If you stay away from all those things, then when life is hard for you, there won't be people there that know that you're missing. you got to get close enough to people that they have to bear with you and you have to bear with them. In Hebrews 12, it talks about good parents, and it says this, they disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for his good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. I always think when I'm cutting rose bushes, what if they could talk? Ow! Ow, Eric! I always think my rose bushes are whiny. No discipline for us seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Do you have peace? Are you tired? Maybe you're tired because you're, you're a Christian, you've given your life to Christ, but the truth is you're not letting God prune you. You're doing whatever you want, and you haven't even thought to say, God, what do you want? And if you're not a Christian, the truth is, hey, you may actually feel better than a lot of Christians who are doing that. Because you don't have the same responsibility. You don't have the Holy Spirit saying, hey, come on. So if you're not a Christian, I encourage you today, maybe today's the day you surrender your life to Him. We look today at three things if you're a Christian. Wrong thinking, acting in our flesh, and focusing on ourself. Instead of all of those things, let's remain in Him. Allow Him to prune us. You don't have to. He doesn't force you, but if you want to walk with him in joy, then you have to. You have to say yes to whatever he asks you to do. You have to surrender any area he tells you to surrender. And can you do that today? If you're here today and you're not a believer, being a believer means that you surrender your life to him. You say, God, whatever you want to prune, I'll let you prune. Whatever you want to do with me, I'll do. I surrender my life to you. And the Bible says that when you surrender your life to him because Jesus died on a cross and rose again, when we make him Lord, which means when we surrender to him, he exchanges our sin for his righteousness so that when God sees us, he sees his righteousness. If you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, we can do that after service. I'd love to talk to you. If you're watching online, you can send me a note online. Normally we have our time of giving here. You can give online if you're giving. Um, if you're here or online, also you can give on your way out if you're here. Thanks for coming this morning. I pray that you would just let God prune those areas, that thinking, those, any area of your life that you would just say, God, you do your will in me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you to do what only you can do. Prune us as a good father prunes us. Lord, we know that sometimes it's painful. Sometimes just like Kurt Warner, we have to go through a painful trial, a struggle. But Lord, I pray as we do that, that your joy would overwhelm us. Lord, as we lose control in certain situations, that we would still know that you are with us always. We surrender all to you. Lord, thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.